welcome to our evening session. Um, as you all know, we have had a um, very busy and full day today, so I'm happy to see so many of you still here this evening. And I'm also really delighted to have Professor Oren Young with us here in the room in a rather two-dimensional way. Um, Professor Oren Young is someone who I think all of us have been influenced by, educated by, and admire greatly for the work that he has done in helping us think about international institutions and the role they play in environmental governance. And I think that we can um, uh, consider Professor Young as also a pioneer in a new way because he has shown us that um, even when one has become an established um, and well-admired scholar, you can move into new technological approaches and show us that we don't actually have to get on an airplane in order to come and make a talk on the other side of the planet. So we're very happy um, to have Professor Young with us here today. This is a bit of a new experiment for all of us. Um, I think uh, this may be one of the first such um, uh, two-dimensional talks um, at the uh, IHBP um, Berlin and Amsterdam conferences, um, but I think it's really terrific that we're doing this. Um, so I'm gonna quickly turn the floor over to Professor Young. It's a little bit for difficult for him to hear us. They have a bit of an echo on their side, so I'm gonna very quickly uh, end my comments here and turn the floor over to Professor Young, um, who will be speaking to us using PowerPoint, um, and therefore you will see him and then not, um, because we unfortunately can't see the PowerPoint and Professor Young at the same time. But maybe um, he'll be able to switch back and forth a little bit so that uh, we get to see his smiling face every now and then. So Professor Young, you're supposed to smile now. <laughs> that's, my, that's my laugh line. You're on. <laughs> Thanks so much, Miranda. It's a pleasure to be in Berlin, even virtually. It would be much nicer to be there in three dimensions, but we'll settle for two dimensions today. Uh, just to reiterate a couple of procedural things, as Miranda said, uh, we could actually show the PowerPoint slides and show myself at the same time. So I will do my best to switch back and forth to give you some kind of mix of the two, and perhaps that will keep your attention as well because you have to watch the, the changing scenery in this presentation. Um, I'll try to talk for approximately 30 or 35 minutes and if possible, that may leave a little time for questions at the end of the presentation. So as you can see from this first slide, uh, the topic of this talk is what I call navigating the sustainability transition. How do we move from current circumstances, the current situation which many of us, and certainly I, believe are in the long run unsustainable, to a more sustainable relationship with the natural environment, with biophysical systems, and specifically what is the role of governance in dealing with the sustainability uh, transition. <coughs> so uh, let me start out with uh, a few comments on what I see as the nature of the problem. Still learning how to use this technology. Uh, in a nutshell, the problem as I see it is that there's a growing gap between reality of the systems we're trying to deal with and the content of the intellectual capital that we commonly draw on to understand the behavior of socio-ecological systems. And I argue that this growing gap threatens to undermine efforts to create effective arrangements to govern human environment interaction. So to unpack that statement just a little bit, um, I argue that we make a number of dubious assumptions. We typically assume 
at least implicitly, if not explicitly, that ecosystems, social systems, socio-ecological systems have relatively benign dynamics in the sense that changes are gradual, system flips are rare, restoration is feasible, and adaptation is both possible and affordable. These assumptions are obviously attractive from an analytic point of view. They allow us to use various forms of analysis, mathematics, and so on that are well known, but the validity or the usefulness of these assumptions is increasingly open to question, especially in the era of global environmental changes and global social changes, which have given rise to human-dominated ecosystems. And in fact, I argue that relying on assumptions of this kind may very well turn out to be a liability, not a positive thing, but a liability, at least in efforts to govern dynamic uh, human environment systems. <coughs> Still trying to work the technology here a little bit to have this nice switch back and forth. Um, so um, what, just to unpack this notion a little bit about the assumption, uh, we find ourselves looking at systems that have a number of distinct and very important patterns of change that we need to recognize and we need to understand in order to build effective governance systems. And here are some examples. We are looking often at systems in which there are nonlinear changes, in which we look at thresholds, tipping points, and system flips. That is to say, systems that that perform more or less uh, stably for a period of time and then have a real flex point, which may be a good thing and may be a bad thing. If you look at corporations, for example, there are many cases of corporations that perform in a more or less stable uh, fashion up to a point and then take off and suddenly go to scale. There are also these nonlinear changes that lead to things like races to the bottom. Now, our changes are often nonlinear, but they may be abrupt. <clears throat> we may be looking at cascades, chain reactions, emergent properties, systems in which we see socioeconomic or political collapse. With respect to climate change, there's a very serious discussion now about the extent to which we may be in for abrupt changes, where at a period of years rather than decades or centuries, there could be some very dramatic change in the climate system. And the changes we're looking at are very often uh, complex changes, by which I mean that they are outcomes of multiple and interactive driving forces. If you look at things like the loss of biodiversity, for example, we're typically looking at changes in land use patterns, changes in legal and political systems, changes in climate temperature, precipitation patterns, and so on. And these things interact with each other so that in order to understand what to do and how to deal with the problem effectively, we need to understand this notion of complex causality, as I like to put it. And then we're often dealing with irreversible changes as well. Uh, limitations to uh, restoration ecology and restoration sociology. It's not the case, for the most part, that once a perturbation is over, and we're no longer having the pressure from the perturbation that the system will simply revert to the status quo ante. Uh, systems typically are moving forward in some fashion that doesn't allow it, at least easily, to restore the situation as it was before the major change. And then finally, I want to say something about limits to adaptation. Uh, in point of fact, it's very clear that necessity is not always the mother of invention. Of course, necessity, crisis, pressure sometimes does create incentives and does result in uh, adaptive capacity, but not always. So we see, for example, in the literature on societal collapses, 
there have been many cases uh, in history in which societies facing some severe pressure have simply not been able to adapt. And so the question of when can we adapt, how can we adapt, and to what extent can we successfully adapt to these kinds of changes is, I think, now kind of front and center in our thinking. So uh, if this is the case, if we live in a world of tipping points, nonlinearity, abrupt changes, irreversibility, limitation of adaptation, complex causation, what are the implications for governance? If, if we want to say we now need to create management systems, governance systems, with this kind of biophysical system in mind, what can we conclude uh, that we need to do with respect to uh, the role of governance? And I want to talk about three things that I think are important implications for governance. I call them harnessing reflexivity, enhancing adaptive capacity, and coping with uncertainty. There you go. Must you see me again for a moment as we move forward to, to looking at these three large implications for governance. Uh, the first one, uh, harnessing reflexivity. We're, in talking about reflexivity, we're, we're, we're thinking about systems in which expectations about the future affect current behavior. That is to say, human systems in which people anticipate things that are likely to happen in the future and adjust their current behavior to uh, address those expected uh, occurrences. And this may lead to um, acceleration and amplification of the changes that might occur if you think about panics, runs on banks, and so on. Or it may lead to um, actions that can uh, dampen or limit or engage in sort of countercyclical kinds of uh, activities, initiatives, uh, in which the anticipated danger, therefore, doesn't occur. Uh, in terms of navigating the sustainability transition, what are the implications of looking at these uh, aspects of reflexivity and the effort to harness reflexivity? There are a few uh, implications that are on the slide I'm about to show you. think. Um, so there are, there's the prospect of counter-cyclical measures. <clears throat> if you're gaining weight and you anticipate that this may cause health risks in the future, if you continue to gain weight, you may put yourself on a diet. It's not an easy thing to do, as those who have put themselves on diets know, but it is a form of reflexivity. You say, if I don't do this, bad things are going to happen. And so I should, in anticipation, take some countermeasures today. And so the question is, can we put the planet on a diet? Or can we put the human communities that dominate these uh, systems today uh, on a diet? Obviously, it's a hard thing to do, but not necessarily impossible. Could we? develop some kind of socio-ecological uh, insurance mechanism or emergency preparedness mechanisms, can we anticipate the kinds of impacts uh, that are likely to occur on barrier islands or coastlines or the canyons of Los Angeles and say, we need to think about those prospects and take some action now, relocation or building protective devices and so on. Social learning, um, there is this concept which is quite powerful in the social sciences about social traps or addictions. <clears throat> we often do things, even as individuals, where the initial results seem to be positive. We get some positive reaction if we, I don't know what, maybe are smokers and so on, or eat certain kinds of food. Uh, but then, over time, as we continue with this practice, we realize that it has negative consequences, that it's going to cause lung cancer or something of that kind. Uh, and we then have often discover that by that time we're addicted. So we start things that look 
attractive and find ourselves addicted to the result. And so, for example, in the 20th century, the American uh, practice of building more and more suburbs and having urban sprawl and so on seemed to be attractive to people moving out of the center cities at the time. But now it's a kind of addiction. Uh, changing the system would require a huge investment. So can we foresee problems of this kind with respect to climate change and avoid the trap at the early stage rather than suffering from the consequences of the uh, addiction. And then there's this issue of social movements. Um, a lot of us in the uh, policy world tend to focus our attention on um, policy instruments and incentive systems like cap and trade or tax schemes for climate and so on. And that's, of course, important. But usually, it seems, when major changes occur, the policy instrument discussion needs to be coupled with some social movement phenomenon, some kind of popular um, uh, growing pressure on the policymakers. And so we need to think uh, with respect to reflexivity of how do we trigger social movements? How do we create some uh, activity like Seattle in 1999 with respect to the trade system, now with respect to climate change? So uh, enhancing adaptive capacity. Uh, as the second of these implications for governance that I want to talk about. Um, we need to de develop better systems of monitoring. Uh, over the last 75 years, uh, economists have developed what they call leading economic indicators. Over the last 20 years, the United Nations has developed something they call the Human Development Index. And so we need to begin the process of developing the um, socio-ecological sustainability index. It won't happen overnight, but it is something that I think is likely to prove to be extremely important as we try to measure our progress, as we try to determine are we going in the right direction or are we not going in the right direction. No indicators are perfect, of course, uh, but having some indicators is better than not having the indicators. The early warning uh, issue. Um, Obviously, in an area like sustainability, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, ocean degradation, land degradation, and so on, there is, of course, a danger of crying wolf. Uh, if you cry wolf too often, people don't believe you uh, when the problem really is uh, severe. But at the same time, we need to, be, to avoid being asleep at the wheel. Uh, and so could we find some kinds of warning signals? You know, what does the flag go up as the gale force winds start to, to blow and you know, OK, uh, that's a warning signal. Or even such very simple things. Uh, Gus Speth, who most of you will know, has written a book called Red Sky in the Morning, uh, which is very much about this kind of notion. The, the metaphor of red sky in the morning comes from the old saying, uh, red at night, sailors delight. Red in the morning, sailors take warning. A very crude sort of notion, but it says that's a warning signal. It's a flag that says, be careful. There are going to be some problems uh, in the next hours to come. Could we have some kind of a warning signal, or several warning signals of that kind with respect to, for example, uh, climate change? Uh, and then this notion of adaptive management. Uh, I think one of the most kind of interesting opportunities we have as we look to countries like the US and China, which today together account for 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions, both of these countries have political systems which can allow for experimentation. The US has 50 states. China has at least as many provinces. And so we have the opportunity to try things out uh, at the subnational level, learn by trying things out with various kinds of experiments and improve our performance when we get to the uh, level of the country as a whole. So coping with uncertainty. The, the, <coughs> the fact of the matter is that however successful we are in developing adaptive capacity, the socio-ecological systems that we will be dealing with are complex and indeterminate. 
we're never going to be able to predict precisely uh, what's going to happen in the absence of policy initiatives or what will be the consequences of particular policy initiatives. And we need to learn that this kind of indeterminacy or imperfect information simply cannot be an excuse for inaction. If we treat indeterminacy as an excuse for inaction, we won't do anything. Uh, so bearing in mind that we know that we may make mistakes, we still need to take action. And here are several things that strike me as interesting in this regard. Uh, precautionary measures. I've been struck over and over again by uh, the extent to which we look at a problem from a worst case perspective or a best case perspective. So when we engage in the development of national security forces, defense spending and so forth and so on, we tend to adopt a worst case analysis. We say, what's the worst that could happen? And we're going to build a defense capacity to successfully prevent or address the worst thing that can happen. On the other hand, it seems to me when we think about climate change, we have some tendency to go to the opposite extreme. We tend, tend to think, well, what's the best that can happen? The best that can happen is, well, maybe there won't be a problem. Maybe, maybe it's a hoax, as uh, an American senator had said in the, in the recent past. And <clears throat> if we let, just let things alone, um, we'll get by fine. Uh, that seems to me to be an equally um, unpersuasive kind of approach to the problem. So it seems to me we need to strike a balance. Um, not worst case assumptions, not best case assumptions, but some kind of intermediate assumption and take the actions that would be suggested by that kind of approach to the problem. There also, of course, are heuristics and rules of thumb. Um, we can try to look for best practices. We can look at a variety of activities. And now we have uh, a fairly large universe of cases to look at as we have hundreds of cities like Salt Lake City, London, and so on, which are taking all kinds of actions to address issues like transportation and other sources of greenhouse gas emissions and say, let's, let's, let's review all these cases and look for the best case uh, 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 experiences. And, the, and distill from all this experience a set of best practices. Uh, there's also the issue of um, targeted research. Uh, in this country, at least, there's been a tendency to draw a rather sharp distinction between basic and applied research. Basic research is kind of curiosity-driven. It might prove relevant at some future time, and maybe you win a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, applied research seems to be the kind of nitty-gritty, um, not too theoretical, very applied, very focused on concrete things. And as various people have pointed out, we, we can and probably should uh, set that dichotomy aside and be looking at research on things that are at one and the same time theoretical and applied. You could win the Nobel Prize, but you can also make a really big difference in a quite well-defined way in the world. This has been called by some uh, analysts on the subject Pasteur's quadrant. Why? Because Pasteur won a Nobel Prize, but you know we have pasteurized milk too, and it may have made a big difference in terms of our uh, direct applied concerns uh, with respect to human health. I think just as an example of Pasteur's quadrant with respect to large-scale environmental issues like climate change would be to launch a program of focused research on the drivers of consumer choice. If we really understood the sources, the drivers, the determinants of consumer choice, that would be a it would be a very important development, achievement, accomplishment, even from a theoretical point of view. But if you assume, as I do, in terms of navigating the sustainability transition, that we're going to have to find ways to make really major changes in the current consumption pattern of the public, at least in the developed world. And as various people have pointed out, if you were to level the rest of the world up to current US standards, it would take five or six planets in terms of the research. So we know that the status quo simply can't go on forever. 
but we don't know a lot about what are the drivers of consumer choice. What would it take to get people to make really significant changes in their housing, in their jobs, in their transportation systems, in their consumer durables, and so forth and so on. A really good example, I think, of Pasteur's quadrant. Now, before going on to the kind of final segment of this presentation, uh, I want to just draw your attention to the fact that governance systems, uh, whether it's the Montreal Protocol on ozone depletion or domestic law, like in the US, the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990, governance systems are complex and dynamic too. So it's not like we have the indeterminacy of the large socio-ecological systems, but we have more certain knowledge about the governance systems. Governance systems are also uh, impacted or also characterized by nonlinearities and institutional collapses, but also in some cases opportunities for growth. We think now that the development, the uh, evolution uh, of governance systems is likely to take the form of what you might call punctuated equilibrium. That is that nothing happens most of the time. And every so often, a series of conditions converge, come together, which allow us to make quite significant changes. And there's a lot to be said for preparing for those moments, even if we can't predict exactly when they will occur. There's also, of course, issues of irreversibility and uncertainty with respect to governance systems as well as socio-ecological systems. Uh, with governance systems or sets of institutions, there are clear irreversibility. The nice metaphor or analytic uh, construct of people who think about sustainability and vulnerability of the adaptive cycle doesn't really apply very well to governance systems or social institutions. The adaptive cycle is a cycle of kind of boom, bust, uh, alternations, which recurs and recurs and recurs, whereas in institutional arrangements, you, when change occurs, you're not likely to get something that reverts back to the status quo ante. We're moving, uh, we're moving on at least as spirals, if, and certainly not as the, the, the cycles. And then, of course, there's the issues of uncertainty with respect to the um, um, supply of governance. Um, it's, a hard, it's hard to forecast institutional development. There are issues of social choice. Uh, governance systems often have the characteristics of public goods, like uh, non-rivalness uh, and um, um, non-excludability. And that creates various issues in the supply of governance. Uh, so just to say at this point that um, governance systems are also complex, dynamic, uh, and indeterminate. So we have the problem of creating institutional arrangements to deal with indeterminate systems, which themselves are hard to forecast uh, explicitly. So the question then is what to do uh, about this. And let me now um, move into the last major segment of this presentation and say, from what I've been presenting so far, I want to extract or distill four principles, the four principles pertaining to governance for navigating the sustainability transition. So let's just go through these four principles. Um, principle one, as I see it, is take full advantage of opportunities to improve knowledge through the use of simulations, scenarios, and other analytic procedures that allow us to explore the dynamics and emergent properties of complex and indeterminate systems. <clears throat> Good examples uh, in other fields that we're probably generally familiar with are things like general circulation models uh, with respect to the Earth's climate system. As everyone who's worked on those uh, systems will point out, uh, first, last, and always, those those simulations, I mean, GCMs are basically large-scale simulations, don't produce predictions. They produce 
projections, or they produce better understanding of the behavior and the dynamics of the system or system, systems in question. You don't do this in order to get a hard prediction of what's going to happen. You do it to get a better grasp on the dynamic properties and the character of the interactions and the sensitivity to changes in initial conditions of the systems in question. And I believe that we can do the same kind of thing in terms of simulating socio-ecological systems and improve our understanding even though this doesn't lead to predictions in the formal sense. Scenarios also, I think, are interesting. Some of you would have seen uh, the so-called GEO reports that come from the UN Environment Program. The fourth GEO report has just come out within the last couple of months. And it has a series of scenarios. Um, it says, well, we can't predict, but we can develop scenarios that, that, that differ on a number of important dimensions and say, suppose the system takes this, the trajectory of w this particular scenario as opposed to that one, what difference would it make? One of the things that we're doing right now is we think about the next assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is can we and should we do a new set of scenarios about socioeconomic processes and socioeconomic development to replace the ones that have been used in the last two uh, IPCC assessments. It's very uh, helpful, I think, in dealing with these complex, dynamic, uh, indeterminate systems. Um, principle two is to draw a clear distinction between what I would see as the core defining features or elements uh, of governance systems and the operating rules or policy instruments that we use to implement them. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I have in mind. Um, we talk a lot now in various uh, areas about ecosystem-based management. Ecosystem-based management is a kind of fundamental orienting conception of the kind of um, governance that we would like to achieve with respect to usually systems with uh, large components of living organisms uh, in them. But there's a, a contrast, I think, between ecosystem-based management as the core element, the defining feature of a governance system, and various instruments like creating protected natural areas, introducing zoning systems, uh, developing individual transferable quotas in fisheries and in other areas. My sense is that all of those are policy instruments, and we should focus, we should make our fundamental commitment to ecosystem-based management and maintain a fairly high degree of flexibility with respect to these particular policy instruments. We shouldn't get stuck on, well, everything depends on marine protected areas. Maybe that's a good idea. Uh, but we say, well, we have a variety of policy instruments. We're, we're fundamentally aiming at ecosystem-based management. Uh, similarly, I think with respect to climate change issues, uh, if we are fundamentally aiming at decarbonization of advanced industrial societies, that's our core element. That's our fundamental commitment. But we have a variety of policy instruments. We have cap and trade systems. We have uh, carbon taxes. We have various new conceptions of regulatory instruments and so forth and so on. My sense, according to principle two, is that we keep our eye firmly fixed on the ball of decarbonization, which is our core element, which is our fundamental uh, goal, and take a rather flexible and experimental approach to the policy instruments. We don't actually know ahead of time whether one particular policy instrument is going to be the right way or whether it's going to be the best way in all of the different domestic systems of the members of a climate regime. But we may know that decarbonization is the name of the game, and that's what we need to focus on even as we experiment with these other kinds of uh, uh, policy instruments. Principle three, um, <coughs> monitor closely both the behavior of socioecological systems and the performance of governance systems and create arrangements that make adjustments or mid-course corrections relatively easy. Uh, because we're dealing with these complex, 
dynamic indeterminate systems, we clearly need to create a situation where it's comparatively easy to make adjustments. The governance systems typically vary quite extensively with respect to the ease or difficulty of making adjustments. We create a system like the American political system uh, based on our Constitution of 1787, changing the rules of the game is relatively hard to do. It requires uh, to amend the Constitution, both action on the part of the Congress and action on the part of the large majority of the states. It's a, it's a hard system to change. And that may very well have been a really good idea in the context of that system. And it may still be a good idea for many purposes in uh, US public policy. But when we're dealing with these socio-ecological systems, which are dynamic, indeterminate, subject to thresholds and tipping points and so on, we need to create mechanisms that allow us somewhat more easily to engage in mid-course corrections. We don't want to change everything at the drop of a hat, because then we just have a completely uh, ineffectual system that wouldn't govern anything. Uh, but mid-course corrections are interesting. An example of this uh, you see on this slide is the system that's been created under the Montreal Protocol of 1987 regarding substances that deplete the ozone layer. The Montreal Protocol calls for the phase out of a number of families of chemicals, various kinds of chlorofluorocarbons, halons, methyl uh, chloroform, so forth and so on. And under the provisions of the Montreal Protocol, acceleration in the phase out schedules of chemicals that are already included in the system can be done without a requirement for ratification on the part of all the members of the regime, the governance system. It's easier to accelerate phase out schedules. And this has been done repeatedly with respect to the chemicals or families of chemicals that are covered under the regime than it is to introduce uh, new kinds of chemicals into the system. Brominated fire retardants, for example, is one of the big discussions right now. Introducing a new family of chemicals would require ratification, but acceleration of the phase of existing ones does not require ratification. So it's comparatively easier to make these mid-course corrections or sort of periodic reassessments and sort of shift the uh, provisions of the arrangement accordingly. That, I think, is the kind of arrangement that we need to be uh, thinking about with respect to a variety of other socio-ecological system issues, as well as we try to navigate the sustainability transition. Um, principle four, uh, in cases where adaptive capacity is limited, build firewalls and redundancy uh, into institutional arrangements to minimize the likelihood of systemic uh, collapse. This is something that uh, happens in a variety of ways. It's happened in nature. Uh, for example, uh, there are lots of situations in which the human brain can actually compensate through various kinds of injuries to continue to have a body that's relatively functional. Not always, of course, but it's remarkable how often these kinds of um, <coughs> Uh, redundancy uh, built into the system. Another firewall example is if you now build a, a modern ship, uh, it will have a whole series of compartments in the hull. So if it gets, if the hull gets penetrated in one place, it doesn't sink the ship. And so you don't have the phenomenon that occurred a couple of months ago in the Antarctic, where a ship called the Explorer got holed by an iceberg. The ship sank. It didn't have sufficient compartmentalization. It didn't have firewalls uh, built into it. So how do we do this with respect to the kinds of issues of the sustainability transition that I'm focusing on in this, uh, in this talk? Well, we could do things like, uh, in the case of climate change, creating backup systems uh, with respect to adaptation. Instead of just saying, well, we've got this change in the temperature change in the active layer of uh, permafrost in the far north and so on, we need to adapt 
we can say we need to adapt and we need to build several different adaptive mechanisms. We don't know for sure which of these is going to solve our problem, but the cost of having a backup system compared to the potential cost of not being able to adapt, not being able to adjust properly to the changes is relatively small. So build in redundancy in a situation of that kind as a way of dealing with indeterminacy, dealing with the limits on predictability, dealing with uh, our uh, limited capacity to um, reduce the uncertainty in our situation. Similarly, with respect to uh, biodiversity, uh, under the international regime dealing with biodiversity, we make a distinction between in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. Uh, obviously, we prefer in situ conservation. Uh, that's the keeping organisms, plants, animals, and so on in their natural ecological niches. That would be better. But on the other hand, in situations where uh, there's a high degree of uncertainty about being able to maintain the viability of a species, we may turn to ex situ conservation for something like, say, the California condor, other charismatic species of that kind, or even other non-charismatic species. It's a, it's a built-in redundancy. And my argument is that to navigate the sustainability transition in a world of dynamic systems and uncertainty, uh, the building in firewalls and redundancy is a uh, very low-cost way of avoiding what may be really big problems. And so uh, I take from this uh, short presentation about navigating the sustainability transition, uh, starting with assumptions that are more realistic than our traditional assumptions about gradual change, um, continuous nonlinear change, uh, large adaptive capacity, uh, capacity of systems to revert to the status quo ante. Once we get over those kinds of traditional assumptions and begin to think about the world as it really is, these are the kinds of implications for governance that, that I see. Uh, and so I will stop there uh, and just to say uh, thank you to all of you. And uh, if there's a possibility for taking some uh, questions and answers, that would be fine. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear the clapping that's going on here. Um, louder, louder. I, <laughs> I also want to say that you do quite a Michael Jackson dance when you're up here on the screen because um, your um, voice comes through in live time, but your body kind of does a robotic movement, and it's really quite, quite amazing. I guess um, I need to take an acting class. I also want to say that you did uh, remarkably well because uh, we have been going for something on the order of 10 or 12 hours now and I was looking at the audience while you were talking in your two-dimensional way here and um, you had everybody listening with great attention so um, congratulations. Um, I think that um, we see Oren Young um, doing what he's done for us before making us think about how institutions tick how institutions need to be designed, and with the new challenges that we are facing with uh, climate change and biodiversity loss, thinking about the need for being able to respond to problems that we haven't really yet had to face before in the form of tipping points, irreversible changes, um, and thinking about how governance institutions may be better adapted to dealing with these kinds of changes I think you give us um, some important ideas about some ways we might start to think about those kinds of institutional changes. And as you were talking, I will um, say that I was trying to imagine um, what of the existing institutions we have now would come closest to the kinds of um, uh, institutional forms that you are thinking of here. Um, but before I ask you to, to respond to that, why don't I see if we can get a question or two from our 
understand that you also have an audience on your side, so maybe we can take a question or two from uh, the Santa Barbara audience as well and have some transatlantic um, communication. Um, um, I might have to repeat the questions that come from the audience so that you can hear them. Um, we can try, I'll, I'll give out this microphone and we'll see if it works. I'd like to ask you, uh, Professor Young, uh, going back to your principle number two, uh, I have a feeling that uh, different stakeholders from uh, business to international community uh, spends too much time with these uh, subsidiary mitigation tools as they were end in itself and undermine the real end in itself, uh, which uh, in is in your own words, uh, Professor a decarbonized uh, society. So do you think uh, the different uh, interests in policy mitigation uh, tools uh, could be a problem or, or to what extent uh, they are a problem to a good governance in a, in a climate change uh, field? Thanks. Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Um, uh, my basic response is that uh, yes, I do think that there's a danger of becoming fixated or overly preoccupied with the sort of fine technical points of different policy instruments and losing track of the sort of linkage between these instruments and our underlying goals. I think part of the problem is that uh, we simply don't know um, until we have much more experience with these more specific policy instruments, how they're going to work in practice. And so rather than uh, spending excessive amounts of time arguing, negotiating, haggling over the little details of the cap and trade system, uh, I think we need to keep our eye on the fundamental goal and have a kind of experimental um, uh, perspective on the more concrete and specific instruments. And very much uh, in an adaptive mode. So let's try out a variety of things, see how they work, and slowly uh, begin to get some real knowledge rather than kind of hypothetical uh, projections about the pros and cons of different specific mechanisms. And I would guess there's likely, uh, if we think about climate change as we go on, uh, to be quite a lot of variance from one country to another as to exactly how it achieves the kinds of reductions that are needed. And uh, I think that's fine. Uh, I don't see that in countries need to use the mechanisms, the specific instruments that are going to be effective in their political and economic and social and legal setting rather than forcing everybody to use the same kind of mechanism. Miranda, we couldn't hear that very well. Could you just um, capture the essence? What, what should I say? We, we, we couldn't hear very clearly. Um, your question had to do with the relationship between mitigation and adaptation? Yes. 
Um, but, but very quickly on that point, uh, uh, of, course, of course we should be concerned with uh, mitigation. Um, but with respect to issues like the loss of biodiversity and um, climate change, these problems are not something that will occur in the future. They're happening now. Uh, and so um, it's clear that I think the climate change negotiations have made that point quite explicitly that we now have to devote considerably increased attention to uh, the issue of adaptation. also about principle two uh, and asking about land and water management. Uh, where I come from in Australia, there's not a consensus really on what the goal should be. You can't say low carbon economy. Um, you can't say manage for ecosystem services because we're arguing about whether to manage for nature or food production or other things. Do you have some advice relevant to that kind of dilemma? Uh, the question about what fundamentally are we managing for, uh, the only advice I can give you on that context is uh, I think you need to confront the issue directly and as long as it takes to arrive at some resolution. Um, it may be hard to do, but I think it's essential uh, because getting bogged down in the ins and outs of the specific policy instruments uh, is likely to be highly ineffective when there isn't any kind of societal agreement or something approaching consensus about what it is we're fundamentally trying to do. Uh, People will push all kinds of different specific instruments. And there'd be no way to determine really whether one of these is more attractive or more appropriate than the other. I think it's a natural human tendency when you can't agree on more fundamental issues to um, set them aside and say, well, let's just talk about the details. Um, it's, it's natural, but I think in navigating the sustainability transition, a bad strategy. Thank you very much, Oren. Why don't we um, give the audience in Santa Barbara a chance to put in a question or two if they'd like to do that? I don't see a hand raised here, so let me just make a final comment, Miranda. This is, as you said, in introducing the talk, uh, an experiment. Um, I'm convinced that uh, we need to move toward using this kind of technology um, in the future and sooner rather than later, uh, which means that we not only have to move ahead in terms of the technological side of things, uh, but we may have to move ahead in terms of our personal performance side of things uh, in order to <coughs> correlate our voice with the dance on the screen. Uh, for example, this is a very interesting learning experience and I'll look forward, I, I'm sure I'll be able to talk to a number of you individually in the not too distant future to getting some um, informal feedback on how this process works so that we can uh, improve our capacity to engage in this kind of interactive uh, relationships uh, around our scientific issues. And so thanks very much for everyone on this side, uh, BJ and her team, and everyone on your side who uh, went through the testing process and um, did what was needed to set this up. I think it's a, a, a great step forward. And thank you again. And have a great rest of the conference.